I think I should explain that when I was doing this work, we did not know whether all the cells of the body have the same genes. Genes are important in deciding how our cells function. And it was unclear, has been for um, thousands of years, whether cells in the body all have the same genes or whether, for example, the brain genes, the brain cells would have different genes from skin cells. With one idea was that the reason brain cells are different from skin is because their genes are different. Actually, it turns out that they all have the same genes. This was not known, and I was put onto the project of trying to do experiments to find out whether different kind of cells all have the same genes or they don't. It's a fairly clear question. For a long time, they said the best explanation for why the brain is like it is and different from heart and different from the skin is that the genes in these cells are different. And it was a famous man called Mendel who first discovered, uh, discovered the principle that there are things like genes which determine how cells behave. Uh, and that was um, fundamental and in, in around 1860. Uh, and so people knew that genes were important and had a lot to do with the way cells function. But it's still interesting in the uh, 1950s, even then, we did not know whether a skin cell had the same genes as a brain cell or they did not. So that, does that sense, uh, question make sense? Well, that was the question we asked. The question is, how did we hope to answer the question? That, that was the next question, next point. And um, people as early as 1880 had envisaged an experiment where you took the nucleus with its genes from one cell and put it into another cell and ask if the uh, cell that received the new nucleus would then change. So if you could do this, you would take the nucleus out of, say, a skin cell and put it into a, a brain cell and see if the brain cell became a skin cell, that sort of concept. Of course, to do that, you have to take away the nucleus from the brain cell, so you replace. So it's a nuclear replacement experiment. Technically, that's difficult to do. So people realized that the best way to do that is to, um, excuse me, to uh, um, use the egg, which is a large cell, and it's easier to put a nucleus into the egg or to take uh, the chromosomes from an egg. So the, the concept of how to go about this problem was fairly clear, and the idea was that if you took the nucleus from an adult cell or specialized cell and put it into the egg and took away the nucleus or chromosomes of the egg, you can ask the question whether this incoming nucleus now makes the whole egg form skin or brain, whatever you start with, or whether the egg changes it and makes it go back to the beginning again and behave like the nucleus or chromosomes of the egg. The fact is I was in a class of 250 students of the same stage and I was in the bottom group. There were 22 such classes and I was in the, uh, the least able one as so I wasn't very good at other work and I came bottom of that one. I mean I was the worst out of 250 in biology. So the biology master teacher said, well this person's hopeless, we, we, there's no question of him trying to make a career in science because he's just no good at that. And so, so that meant I was taken away from that subject of science all of the rest of my school time and was put into ancient Greek and Latin. Uh, not because I was thought to be particularly good at that, but they had too many teachers and had to give them something to do. So they, the people who were, I know they said of me, he has no ability to undertake any subject in depth. And so we put him in the bottom and put him into the sort of dumping 
class of people who were not able to manage anything much. That's how it happened. I was taken off it immediately after only uh, a few months, one term, one semester. And that's, uh, we, we, at that time, we, we only did, you only started science aged 15. That's the age I was. And they, the teachers said, well, we've got to put him in some direction. At least we'll get rid of the ones where he's no good. <clears throat> and that was <clears throat> how that happened. But um, I think it was, so it was really my parents in, who could see that what I actually was interested in was biological things, not, not ancient Greek. All my holiday time, I would spend collecting insects and growing plants and that sort of thing. And I never opened a, a, an ancient Greek book ever in the holiday time. <laughs> but I had, I had lots of books on insects and that sort of thing and plants. The school said, well, we're not going to teach him science. He, he's no good at that, so we're, we'll take him off that. My parents couldn't do much about that. I mean, the school says we're going to teach you what we think we can. Um, and um, it was they who got me back into, the, when I'd finished my school time at a fee-paying school, they then said, we'll take a, give you a year in which to try and get you back into science, having had to give it up. I'm very sorry for them. I mean, it's a, uh, all this money almost completely wasted. The only good thing is that the, in retrospect, the teacher was such a bad teacher that I was spared being badly taught for three more years at school. Um, uh, other people I've met since were taught by this teacher and they all said he was terrible. I mean, he wasn't even, uh, most of the time he was wrong in what he said. So, I mean, factually wrong, you know, he teaches the wrong information. So it was a sort of relief to be no longer uh, under the control of someone who wasn't a good teacher. My mother in particular had seen what I spent all my time doing and um, she made a lot of efforts to get me interviewed by the professor of zoology in Oxford who she happened to know and, and she said to him what this boy is really interested in is biological sciences. Do you think you could accept him to do a biological degree? And he, all he could do was to say, well, if you take a year off from schoolwork and really work hard at science and pass the elementary exams, then we could take him. So I had to take a year off from my expensive school to switch completely to learning elementary science. And, uh, and they said, well, if you pass those exams, you, we can, you can go on. And uh, luckily I did pass them, but it was hard work. I mean, it was what they call a crammer. You just spend day after day being crammed with information. Uh, and then at the end of all that, they give you an exam and say, ask you questions and you have to learn the answers. It was really, uh, the sort of science that we don't like now, it was just learning facts. Um, there was no analysis to it. <clears throat> I mean, the natural mind says, well, why does this happen? Uh, I was very keen on growing uh, insects, uh, caterpillars that grow into moths. And a good question would have been, why does that happen? How do they do it? That wasn't the point. You just had to learn the name of the insect and they test you on that. And then when that's all, when the memory test has been done, you're then allowed to begin to ask more interesting questions of mechanisms. So that was how I survived. <laughs> Wouldn't have been possible now if you had no elementary knowledge of biology age 18. There's almost no hope of being able to catch up and switch. The view I took was that if you, at school, and you learn ancient Greek, there's no, the best you can possibly do is to be as good as other people who already learnt it. You're merely going back, at best you stay where we are. There's nothing new about that at all. Um, and that would be true of many subjects. So I think there's a, 
total fascination in advancing human knowledge and, and seeing what can be done with it. So I've always take that view. I would take it now. I would say people who choose to study um, Greek languages or any other kind of languages, already people know how to speak those languages, nothing new. Uh, whatever language you learn, there are people who speak it perfectly. So you're just trying to um, do as well as they do. There's nothing novel or challenging except uh, just memory. And, and, uh, and many subjects in the arts field are a bit like that. Um, even law, You're mainly what you do in law is to learn the principles that previous lawyers have established. They say under these circumstances, this is the judgment that should be made. So you learn uh, from them to try and make these decisions which they know how to make. There's nothing novel, nothing challenging in my view really about that. So I'm, I'm rather a, a die-hard at science in that sense. <laughs> I would got into the biology course at Oxford University and uh, I had problems with that because a lot of that was just memory. You learn the names of things. Um, <clears throat> but in the last year I um, somehow got the idea of how to answer these exams. Um, and that got me a good, a good, a good degree. And then the person who I worked under, I'd applied, you see, at that point, to do a PhD in entomology. So I was interested in insects. And luckily, in retrospect, the professor rejected me. That was quite right, because he wasn't a very good entomologist anyway. But the person who took me on was someone in a different subject. And he actually said to me, would I be interested in doing a PhD under him? And that was a huge blessing. He was extremely good uh, as, a, as a mentor. And um, I owe an enormous amount to him. I mean, he sort of picked me out of the, uh, the rubbish bin, more or less, and said, you can come and do your PhD with me, with him. So that was a, an enormous blessing. He had a Swiss name, Fischberg. He, he was, when you trace him back, he, his mentor was another Swiss whose mentor was another one and back and that goes back to a famous man in direct lineage called Spemann who is the only person in this field who got a Nobel Prize so uh, about four, gener four science generations downwards um, I, I uh, was able to pick up something from that lineage <laughs> He gave me free choice. He, he, entered, he said, here's a, a problem for you, um, <clears throat> and this is how you might try to do it. <clears throat> Why don't you try? And uh, as often happens, it didn't work for a while. Um, <clears throat> but he kept saying, well, try changing this or try something different. Uh, and uh, suddenly it suddenly worked. Uh, not, not very obviously why, but it did. And so from then on, he was extremely enthusiastic and he used to say, this is fantastic, now this is the way you should go. And he, was, he left me entirely to myself. I mean, he didn't tell me how to do experiments. He just said, this is what you should aim for, and what you're doing is going very well, so carry on. That was a very free kind of way of teaching. What he put me on to was um, this question that we started talking about. That is to say, do all cells have the same genes? So he could see that was a crucial question. And um, he was aware of people who tried to do it and didn't succeed. So he said, it's worth doing it a different way. Try different ways of doing it and see what happens. And that was, uh, nowadays it would be more normal for a, a, a supervisor or mentor to say, this is what you should do. Uh, try doing the following the following way. He didn't. He said, "Well, this is the problem is very important, and just try anything you can think of that might might work." It was a very relaxed way of doing it. I was in Oxford, and and uh, they have a rather nice uh, sort of wild area uh, reservation. 
uh, where you get permission, you can go out there and walk. And I used to go out and collect insects. And uh, I went out one cold March day with a net, and nothing, there were no butterflies or moths, but some fly came by, so I caught the fly and thought, well, I, I must find out what this fly is. So I got all the necessary books, and it didn't fit at all. So I went on and on, and, and it, it wasn't actually a fly, it was more like a bee, but it didn't matter. I caught it, and, and I went through all these books, and it just didn't fit. Every time they said, you'll find that it now has different kind of legs, well, it didn't. It just didn't agree at all. So I, uh, I thought, I can't just give up. So I went to this entomology department, and they said, we don't know what it is. You better go up to the Natural History Museum and ask them what it is. So I got in touch with people there in London and went along, and the man said, this is very odd, you know, it's a, um, <laughs> this, this thing has never been seen in this country before. <laughs> Most extraordinary thing. Um, so, uh, and, and that became a, a little paper. And this, this, it was a little kind of sawfly. And the, the embarrassing thing is that this place I went to was where the professor of entomology was working and his main project was to identify all the uh, insects that he could find in that place. And here was this student who just spent one Saturday afternoon and caught something that uh, was of immense interest and which he'd never, he'd never noticed. So that is probably one good reason why he didn't accept to have me as a PhD student. <laughs> so it was a curious thing. That was my first publication. Nothing to do with what I later did. Even at a very young age, um, it was amazing to me that you could take a seed from a plant and somehow that grew into a plant. Even more striking, as a matter of fact, is the what we now call frog spawn. And you go to the ponds, you find that these black eggs they are actually, um, and they turn into a tadpole. Now, how do they know how to do that? <coughs> The mother can't teach them. So the mother doesn't, isn't there anymore. She lays there and disappears. And no one else comes along to tell them how to do it. Somehow they know how to do that. And that's, that has always been a, a fascinating problem to me, to think how can an, an egg know how to turn into a tadpole or frog? But when I was under 10, I was the age of about seven or eight, I, I was so keen on plants, I was given a piece of our garden to, as my own, could plant whatever I wanted and grow it. And, and then that turned into looking at butterflies and hence growing butterflies and hence asking the question of how could it possibly happen. So gradually the questions kind of emerge uh, when you, um, I think at a young age, many younger people ask, how or why does something happen? And that, that's a, a good sign that they uh, are sufficiently interested to pursue the problem, the subject. Um, if you're being drafted, you see, when my father thought that I do so bad at school, I'd have to go into the army. It's the sort of thing you can do if you're, you're thought not to be particularly motivated. I hated the, any thought of the army, so I was desperate not to get into that. Um, and then he said, well, maybe we'll put you into um, a London solicitor's firm where you can, you know, shuffle paper. That wasn't very interesting to me. So it was really my mother who took the, the decision to try and get me into science. Because uh, all my, everything I did at home was all to do with plants and insects. It seems a fairly obvious question when you see things happen to wonder, how, how they happen, what, what is, how can it be? You see, when the, in the 1800s, they could see that frogs spawn, these eggs turned into tadpoles, and they, they, even then they'd say, well, how can that be? And so the idea at that time was probably the same as many people have now. If I stopped someone in the street, said, excuse me, uh, tell me, how does this frog spawn turn into a tadpole? What sort of answer do you think you'd get? They might say, well, um, perhaps there's a miniature tadpole inside the egg. That's the best idea. And that you can't see it because it's so small. It just grows bigger and bigger till this little miniature tadpole or frog 
could be seen. That was a plausible idea. Otherwise, you're right. I mean, how can it possibly happen? And when you look inside a frog egg, which you can do now microscopically, there is no tadpole there, no frog at all. It's just like soup. But somehow it knows how to turn itself into what we see. So they're uh, very good questions, I think. And um, if a younger person, um, uh, my, my advice always to younger people is uh, wait, find something you're interested in and pursue it. Doesn't matter what it is. Um, don't be pushed into some direction that you think is just boring and, and, and useless. And many people who were very successful in their careers turned out that they were very interested and keen on whatever it was at an early age. Um, we hear of famous sportsmen who um, start uh, playing sport age two or three, and that's what they really like. So parents wisely say, well, all right, um, I'll give you a tennis racket or something, and you can just try your hand at that. Um, so I think the advice is to um, younger people encourage them to find anything they think is interesting and pursue it. While I was struggling with the ancient Greek and Homer and that sort of thing, half the time I was thinking, uh, how can these caterpillars grow? I used to keep them in my room and, and, and to the irritation of the schoolmaster. <laughs> um, and the amazing things happen. So I think there are some younger people have a natural interest in something, and um, it's often things they can't do much about, uh, but sometimes they can. Well, I suppose if you, you should say, well, what about someone who um, is, comes from a family in which the father is quite successful in business, and the child might be encouraged to be good at the business. Now, I can imagine there is some challenge there to advance the business, but um, um, I, I suppose, to, to me, I'm that kind of person who wants to always see something going forward, not just repeating what's already been done. and. Uh, I think science really offers that in a way that other things perhaps don't, at least. In your career, you always have uh, opportunities, sometimes to do something different or sometimes to say the same. And uh, you, most people, and I think I'm one, would say, I, I, take, I prefer to follow the route that is um, most likely to be successful. So I could see by getting underway with the work we started that there's, every time you will answer one question, there's always another question. And um, you think, well, I can see how to, how to go on from there, go further. So you see, you follow the opportunities which present themselves. Now, if I'd found that at an early stage they said, uh, we've received this application for grant support to carry out your work, but we don't like it. We're not giving you anything. I would have had no opportunity, so I'd have to have done something different. But if, as long as the opportunities keep presenting themselves, there's a very strong temptation to say, well, I'll follow this opportunity. Um, I was lucky in that opportunities kept uh, coming up. You might say, why a frog? And that's because the frog has bigger eggs than other animals. Now, you might say a chicken's egg is bigger, or a crocodile's egg is bigger, but most of the chicken's egg does not form an embryo. The frog is unusual in that the whole egg forms an embryo, a tadpole. And in, in chickens, only a tiny part of what's in the egg actually forms the embryo. So the frog has always been a choice uh, for experimental biologists over, over um, centuries. The clones that we made 
were favoured by magazines and newspapers. So they were rather spectacular. You know, we, we used an albino donor into uh, the, the nucleus from an albino cell into cells, uh, dark pigmented cells, and all the offspring came out albino. So it was quite, quite striking visually. And that was called cloning, but it was uh, absolutely not at all the purpose of the experiment. From our point of view, cloning was a trivial consequence of the main experiment. Cloning, as in plants, just means that you make more of what you've already got. So um, most, most plants are now propagated for sale by cloning. You, you take a, 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 a twig or something from a plant and you put it in the ground and it makes another one. Uh, that, that's really what cloning is. And so they saw the amphibian work as being sort of rather like that. But we, we didn't use the word cloning. That was not what we wanted to do. It, it, and we published a picture of clones, you know, 30 frogs looking identical, uh, all albino from a mother frog, which wasn't albino. It was quite striking. But uh, that wasn't the purpose of the experiment. It was scientifically, that was trivial. <laughs>
because if it doesn't go perfectly and I were to run some kind of legal case against them, the lawyers would say, well, we'll, we'll, we'll award the patient a few million pounds and I must now uh, go bankrupt in order to pay for it. So uh, they, they, they really, I think, cause the real blockage in these techniques being useful to people. The big advance came when uh, Takahashi and Yamanaka were able to achieve a somewhat similar result with mammal cells, mouse cells. Um, and they, it was done a completely different way. Uh, it's extremely inefficient, but it does work. So that was why it then became clear to people that you could use this, um, whether you call it cloning or um, cell replacement, you can use that as a route into curing disorders by cell replacement, not by gene replacement. In, in the thing I'm talking about, the cell replacement, you don't change the genes, they're already there. You, you say, we'll take skin, and uh, they already have the same genes as your eye cells. We're just going to increase the number of skin cells and switch them back into being embryo cells, like they originally were. And then you grow the embryo cells and divert them into becoming eye cells. <clears throat> and that's, um, <clears throat> that's what we mean by cell replacement. I think what was critical was that it had to be shown that this whole approach, the cell replacement or cloning approach, um, could be done in, in mice and hence, therefore, in principle, in humans. And that was, uh, our work never got that far. Uh, the, the fundamental principle is the same, but the actual demonstration of doing it, same thing in for the benefit of humans, I would say, was not clear. It took 40 years or so, more like 50, for that to be clear. I think the people who choose the Nobel recipients um, realized that our work could be seen to be the original work that made the whole thing possible in principle. And then <clears throat> it had to be diverted or changed in procedure to make it appropriate for human application. The work we did was on frogs, and uh, people would say, well, I'm not interested in cell replacement in frogs, obviously, because the frogs are perfectly OK without that. Um, and when we did this, if we'd applied for a grant to do research to try and do it in mammals, it would have been unlikely to be successful, because um, we um, well, I'm not an expert on mice or human eggs, but, and it required a lot of work by other people to make that a realistic possibility. Um, so, um, well, I, uh, I was fortunate in getting research grants for the work I wanted to do, but we didn't ask for the grant in order to bring about cell replacement in humans. We didn't ask for that. You need a good question to start with and a, a purpose. And we had a question and a purpose to, to see if genes are the same. And uh, that led on to the, uh, since we could take an adult cell and rejuvenate it back to the beginning, the obvious question is, can you now switch the direction of the rejuvenated cells? That depended on other work that had been done, was being done at that time. Um, but it's still true that the, um, the, the ultimate benefit of this early work that I did was not at all clear at that time. I was always wanting to answer a question or finding out a way of doing something. And uh, I, I actually have published papers throughout that whole period. I think I'm about 350 an hour, so at no point was I not doing something that was working well enough to get another grant? So you could call it fallow. It was, by most standards, it wasn't really fallow at all. It was quite good. It was answering other questions or questions at a lower level. But still, um, it was answering questions, and it followed an opportunity.
Um, even now, I feel that I'm quite motivated by what I do in the in the in the lab. And uh, um, I was talking to someone who uh, wanted me to talk to them just before speaking to you, and uh, uh, I explained to them the problem, and they said, "Oh, that's really very interesting." I was rather pleased. So. Um, uh, I can see a real, a real reason to want to progress in this direction, and it's a, a basic question, and I would like to be able to go on with that. So I think I can see what one can do about it. And perhaps at intervals through my career, there's always been another question you think you can uh, contribute to, analyze something. You try to do something and it just doesn't work. You say, I think I can, I might say, I think we can find out how um, cells behave when you treat them this way, and in the worst case, they just die. Whatever you do, they don't survive, so it just doesn't work. You haven't found the right conditions, so you have to uh, take a, a slightly different route, not always entirely different, but at least go off more in that direction. And then you find a block there, so you then try thinking you have that one might work. So you all the time you're sort of working your way uh, up the uh, up uh, forward, but not always in exactly the same direction. Sometimes one thing doesn't work, so you try another, and that one looks more hopeful. I am working on a question that interests me a great deal, and it's rather simple to explain. Uh, you know that our brain and our heart and our skin are very different from each other. But each of these parts of our body consists of a huge number of cells. Um, I would say 10 to the power 11 cells, that's about um, 100 billion cells in the brain or the heart. But they're all working the same way. So you don't find skin cells in your brain or heart cells in your liver. So these huge number of cells go on being made, and they're all, they all, all work perfectly. So that raises the question of what make, why do they not change? How, what keeps them in the same, same route? And it's the other side of the question that, that I've survived on so far, which is to create new cells from, one, from things like skin. You use skin and you get eye cells. I'm now taking the other view and say, well, that's amazingly difficult to do. Cells don't like that at all. So what stops them going wrong? Sometimes they do go wrong and they become cancerous. So you want to know what holds them in an absolutely dedicated way in the same direction to an enormous extent. And I, I think that's a very important question. Nearly all our cells, uh, once they've chosen a route, they stay that way. Good thing they do. We don't want it otherwise. But we'd, we'd like to know how that happens. Uh, and that's what I'm working on now. Yes, <laughs> um, there are good questions in butterflies, but I don't think I'm yet quite ready to embark on those. So um, our retirement, that's uh, those of us who are lucky enough to work in a lab, we always come in and think, well, Maybe tomorrow I'll find a note from the director saying, I, I wish to have your space emptied by you uh, at the end of this week. You'll find another job. Uh, that could happen any time. I could be dismissed. Uh, I use space. Uh, I get my own money. It doesn't have to, I don't cost anything. But they could say there are younger people who could make better use of your space. So uh, I, as director, will ask you to move out. It can happen any day. Maybe in this week I'll find a letter from the director saying it's time you, you, you got out of the way. But until that happens, I'm very keen to go on and work on the problem that I think is very interesting. So retirement can be imposed on you at any moment. And we're mostly grateful that it hasn't happened so far. <laughs> on butterflies, I keep thinking about that. I'll tell you why, because many... Butterflies have an extraordinary colour pattern. You common ones in this country have an eye spot, and moths do too, which is on the wings. 
and the, the evolution invented that so that birds who are going to eat them are put off by these apparent eyes. Um, and the, the fact is that the color patterns in the eye of insects and, um, for that matter, colored fish, it's absolutely obscure how those are formed. The, the, the mechanisms we know that make a leg become different from an arm or a brain simply don't apply in that case. So there's some mechanism which we don't understand at all, which is enabling these sheets of cells to make these extraordinary patterns. Uh, I would find it very interesting to know how that happens. It w wouldn't be probably any use to anyone if I did know, but at the moment I'm more uh, committed to this other question, and uh, uh, if I really get dismissed, I might have to go back to butterflies and see what happens then. <laughs>